Welcome to the Trainers Bullpen, where trainers in the law enforcement space come to hear the experts talk about their work, experience, and research into human performance, particularly as it relates to the critical aspects of training motor learning and crisis decision making. The purpose of the Trainers Bullpen is to help bridge the gap between law enforcement training and the findings of academic research and current pedagogical best practice. Our desire here at the Bullpen is to help advance law enforcement training to make research applied and improve officer and public safety. The Trainers Bullpen is a production of Raptor Protection, and I'm Chris Butler, your host. And today it's my pleasure to welcome to the show Dr. Jay Dawes. Jay Dawes is Associate Professor of Applied Exercise Science at Oklahoma State University. Dr. Dawes has worked as a university athletic performance coordinator, strength performance coach, personal trainer, and educator for approximately 25 years. He also frequently coaches and provides sports science support to numerous elite and professional teams, as well as law enforcement, fire, and military. His primary research interests are focused on improving health, fitness, and human performance for the tactical athletes, first responders, as well as sports athletes. He has a broad background in strength and conditioning with specific training and expertise in training and conditioning methods for athletes and first responders. Dr. Dawes, welcome to the Trainer's Bullpen. Thanks, Chris. Appreciate being here. Awesome. So I was excited to come across a paper that you published back in 2022. And the paper we're going to be kind of using as our springboard, our foundation for our discussion today is called Profiling the Injuries of Law Enforcement Recruits During Academy Training, a Retrospective Cohort Study. And this paper was published in BMC Sports Science, Medicine, and Rehabilitation. And for our listeners, of course, the research paper is going to be attached to the show notes. And if you're happening to listen to this podcast on your favorite podcast channel, please hop over to the Trainers Bullpen at, train, at trainersbullpen.com and download a copy of the paper. So, uh, Dr. Dodds, thanks for making the time. I'm excited to talk to you about this issue of recruit injuries as a career law enforcement officer, and I've spent over 25 years in training in the academy, teaching both recruits and in-service, as well as my interactions with fellow trainers across North America. Uh, recruit injuries are an incredibly significant problem. And it's a problem not only, obviously, for the recruits who are getting injured, who find themselves then uh, either uh, falling behind in the training cadence or having to be back trooped into, into a future class, or perhaps we've seen injuries even so significant that it pre precludes them from progressing in that occupation. And uh, of course, injuries are a huge concern for executives in police departments who are already scrambling to try to graduate sufficient number of recruits in academy classes in order to keep up with attrition on the street. So this is a this is a huge, hugely important topic. And so uh, first, uh, what I'm going to do is just read the abstract from your sure. report, and then and then we can get right into it here. So in your report, you say injuries within law enforcement are a significant issue as they increase organizational costs and workforce strain is one of the biggest risk factors of future injury is previous injury. Minimizing injuries suffered during academy has multiple beneficial and long-term effects, including the healthier and fitter police force. The purpose of this study was to profile the injuries sustained at a law enforcement academy in order to inform future injury mitigation strategies. So that's all awesome. Let's uh, let's get into this study. Can you sure. can you can you tell us? So you you have a, a, a obviously from your bio and and your experience there. You have an incredible background in fitness and fitness science, and so you have a particular interest in this area, but. Jay, can you tell us, like, what was it specifically that sort of sparked your interest in wanting to explore injuries in police training? Yeah, unfortunately, it came from seeing a lot of injuries. Um, you know, it's it's one of those things where 
you know, you know, ultimately the goal of training academy is to get people prepared to become police officers and, and join the workforce. And, you know, if you can't get through that process, then that means, you know, ultimately you're you're not going to be able to to be in that occupation. So, you know, I think you know, kind of going back to my sports background, you know, normally what we do in the world of sport is we do kind of a basic needs analysis. So, you know, we, we kind of look at, okay, what are the needs of, you know, what do you need from a physical standpoint to be successful in whatever activity or sport that you're going to be in from uh, kind of a metabolic standpoint, a biomechanical standpoint. And then we also look at injury profiles, you know? So, I mean, to kind of go to the sports world, like, you know, looking at, you know, athletes that are then overhead throwing sports, we know that they're going to be more susceptible to shoulder injuries. So knowing that what we want to do is make sure that we're integrating different types of prehabilitation programs into the training program to make sure that we can you know, either reduce that injury from occurring or the risk of that injury from occurring, or, you know, make sure that the severity of it is going to be lesser than what it would otherwise be. And, and really, so when I kind of transitioned and started doing more within you know, the law enforcement occupations and things like that, it was really just kind of that same process is kind of looking at it through that lens is, you know, these are individuals that have to be involved in physically demanding jobs. Um, you know, the, the major difference though, is like, you know, at you know certain times it's, it's literally a matter of life and death and public safety. So the stakes are much higher in many cases than what it is in just like, you know, a sporting endeavor. Um, but, you know, kind of looking at, you know, what are the most common injuries that they sustain and then how do we help reduce the risk of those from occurring in the future? Okay, great. And you use the term, which is a relatively new term to me, although I have seen it now in, in a few research papers and you, that term was prehabilitation. So we often talk about rehabilitation. Everybody would know what that means is I'm injured and now yeah. I go through rehabilitation, but prehabilitation is a, is a critical concept because you're talking about identifying those potential risks mm -hmm. of how are our injuries occurring and what are the, the risks to our students, our performers, and how can we condition them in order to reduce those injuries from occurring is, 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 do I understand that correctly? Prehabilitation? 100% accurate. I mean, it's like, you know, I guess to put it in, in pretty simplistic terms, like, especially in law enforcement, I mean, there's, <laughs> this is, this is going to sound terrible, but I think most people on this podcast will probably understand this, but there's really not much about the job that's conducive to health and fitness. <laughs> so Basically, a lot of what we have to do is kind of undo what the job may potentially do to you. Um, just from, you know, thinking about, you know, spending long periods of time in sedentary positions and then, you know, basically having to go from zero to hero, right? So we're, we're looking at it from a situation where, you know, let's say you're sitting in a car, um, you know, for a, let's say it's a 10 hour shift. Most of that time, like you're sitting in kind of that uh, you know position where the shoulders are rolled in, hip flexors are you know kind of tucked. So the you know things are getting muscles, certain muscles are getting shorter and tighter, others are getting looser and weaker, and it alters length tension relationships. That when you do have to go into action, you maybe have to do something that's strenuous. We're already starting at a little bit of a disadvantage there, and those imbalances can lead to future injuries. Um, and, and, you know, so it's one of those things that it's interesting, you know, like, uh, there's certain acute injuries that we can't really stop. I mean, you know, I mean, if, if you break your hand on the back of somebody's head in, you know, a situation, I can't do much about that. But on the flip side, if you're in a foot chase and you have a non-contact knee injury, that might be something that I can influence through your training to make sure that, you know, either one, the severity of it's going to be less or two, when you get in that position, you have a little bit better joint awareness and strength to help support that. Um, so, yeah, like you said, from that prehabilitation standpoint, you know, a lot of what we'll do is we'll look at, like, what does an officer have to do on the job? You know, and some of that's going to be dictated based off what their, you know, their primary specialty is. I mean, if they're, you know, investigations or if they're patrol or SWAT or whatever it may be and, and trying to think about, okay, what what are the potential downstream effects of things like load carriage and, you know, different tasks that may be performed and where are those injuries more likely to occur? And then trying to address that in the training program to, to try and help reduce the risk of that happening in the first place. Excellent. And as far as the Academy goes, when we have new officers that are, are coming in from the civilian world, mm -hmm. one of the things that I think, and I don't know if there's a study that would put, an objective number to this, Dr. Dawes, but one of the things that trainers 
uh, frequently will attest to is that the recruits that we're getting now come, there was a time when the bulk of our classes, they had a fitness background, they had a sporting background, they had martial arts background, they came from uh, some type of an environment that where they had already developed proprioceptive abilities, good core stabilization, action, reaction, time. Um, but now we're, it seems like we're almost even further in a deficit at the beginning because we've got a short period of time to get these largely sedentary individuals to a level where they can now fight in a violent confrontation with massive uh, full power, ballistic, mm -hmm. torsional types of movement. And so it's like you go, how do we go from zero to hero in the very short time that we have with these people? Yeah. And unfortunately, there's not a great answer for that. Um, we can definitely talk about some strategies, but I think that's the one thing, I, not to be the, the rain cloud guy, but one of the things that we're actually seeing at the university level is we do a lot of work with our Army ROTC program as well. And so we've done just some really basic surveys talking to the, the kids about, you know, what's your previous training experience? What's your sports background? You know, what kind of activities you've been involved with? And uh, it, it's actually a lot lower than what it used to be. And in addition to that, we're dealing with, you know, the COVID babies that are coming through now. So they're even more stunted in that way where they just haven't got the reps in that, you know, we, we used to get. Um, so that that is, I think, going to be one of the emerging challenges that we continue to see. And, you know, a lot of you know, me and me and a lot of my colleagues now, we're kind of even pointing to the fact that, you know, this actually creates not only a, a public safety issue, but maybe a national security issue at the same time, because, you know, we have a, a group of individuals that are coming through that just aren't necessarily physically prepared to withstand the rigors that they may be put through. Um, so, yeah, it's it's a real challenge, you know, and we were kind of joking before the show. But, I mean, I guess to some extent, it's somewhat job security for me, but that's not really a great thing at this point. Because, <laughs> you know, we I think what we need to look at doing is like, how do we how do we help give these people the things that they probably should have getting, been getting back in junior high and, you know, at, at an earlier age just to learn how to move and be more more efficient human beings when it really gets down to it, much less building like capacity on top of that. Right. Good. And, and I would want to ask you as we get near probably the last half of our interview to talk about some of those strategies that you might recommend, but let's Absolutely. look at your, let's look at your study right now, Jay. Yeah. So tell us what was you, you, what was your methodology and how did you undertake this? Yeah. I mean, so essentially what happened is this was um, retrospective data that we were provided by one particular law enforcement agency um, I can I can give a general location it was in California. So it was a it was a big uh, group of individuals that we worked with in a, a relatively large agency. Obviously, we don't want to divulge like what that agency was necessarily. But, um, you know, we we looked at data, retrospective data for several years of uh, training academy. So basically, when recruits would go through, um, they would document what the injuries were. And then <clears throat> what we did is we went back and looked at to see okay, what are, what are our trends here? Um, so, you know, the, the study wasn't necessarily like rocket surgery by any means. I mean, it was just basically kind of looking like, okay, here's the state of the state, and this is what we're tending to see. And what we're, the reason we were trying to do that is, you know, with the agency that was involved, we were trying to help them come up with ways to help reduce the risk of those injuries from occurring. Because, you know, as you said before, like injuries in an academy are very costly. And I think, you know, a lot of times people equate that to the cost of just the, you know, the cadet um, by themselves, but we don't really look at like the downstream effect of that. Because if that individual gets injured and they were prompts to go to, you know, maybe a certain you know, substation or whatever it may be, and now they're not, they're not going there anymore, that creates a deficit there, which puts a strain on the rest of the staff there to pick up more shift work. And, you know, so again, it, it kind of has that, that negative spiral of health for not just you know, the, the academy, but the whole agency. And, uh, you know, when we're looking at long-term health and wellness for the officer, um, there's, there's a lot of those different factors where, you know, that one incident has a massive impact on the entire group that sometimes isn't really considered in the total cost. Yeah. And the, and the frequency as I, if I recall correctly from your study was somewhere in the neighborhood of around 37%, um, of, recruits at some point during their training were injured. And as I was reflecting on that 
that number, that was to me very, it resonated because I mean, we didn't do a statistical analysis like this, but just from my subjective experience with, with recruit classes over many years is probably in the neighborhood of 30% of recruits at some point experienced an injury. So I, I don't think, although you, you say that this is one academy, I would encourage the listeners to really reflect on and look at, well, what's happening in our agency and in our academy. And are we really that much different? Maybe you are, maybe you're doing something uh, that the rest of us would like to know about how you're reducing those injuries. But so speaking of injuries, what, what kinds of injuries primarily did you see occurring with recruits in the academy? Well, and I think, and it's really, really important, Chris, to highlight, like, this was one academy. So, you know, at different academies, the injuries may be different based off kind of what what things are taking place. Um, but here, you know, the biggest ones probably, I mean, not a big shock is going to be, you know, knees, ankles, lower extremity issues were probably, they were the, the major issues. Um, and then, you know, we saw, you know, a fair number, you know, lower back would come in kind of secondarily to that and then shoulders as well, which kind of makes sense if you look at the shoulder. I mean, there's the orientation of, you know, how that joint is constructed it's great because it gives you a huge range of motion but that's also the bad thing is it's it's basically getting stabilized by four very small muscles to keep it in place so um shoulders tend to be one that you know is another issue that we see and again those numbers can vary based off the agency based off the types of training that you engage in and uh you know kind of what the the tactics and techniques may be because i mean to give you a for instance we didn't necessarily publish a research study on this but other agencies you know, we saw I mean, in, in, in this particular study, most of the injuries occurred during physical training. However, in a lot of the other agencies that I've worked with, it mostly occurs in like defensive tactics, which kind of makes sense because, I mean, that's, you know, probably during an academy, at least from what I've seen. Um, those are the weeks that are going to be like the most, you know, full on intense weeks that you're going to go through. Um, you know, and that in combination with the fact that, you know, typically they're going to happen a little bit later in the academy. So, I mean, you've already had all this other stress that's compounded. And a lot of times when people break, that's that's a pretty good time to break, to be honest. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it's it's one of those things where you look at the different agencies and the different types of training that goes on. You know, it could vary. But I think that's that's the whole reason to go through this process is to kind of take a hard look at, OK, what's happening in our respective agency? What are the you know major injuries that we're seeing? When are they occurring? And is that is that an us issue or is that something like the people that are coming in that we need to maybe get them, you know, more uh, bolstered up in certain areas before we engage in other types of training. So when you say physical training, are you talking then specifically about fitness training? We're talking about like resistance training and and cardio. Is that what you mean? Primarily. So any, anything that's going to be related to, you know, basically building capacity. Okay. So we're making a distinction here then between physical training and defensive tactics or DT training. Yeah. And from our perspective, it's really important to do that because I mean, they are very different, right? I mean, even though they're, they're all physically demanding, there are different skill sets and things of that nature. So. Okay. And so were, was there a fairly even split of these injuries that were occurring in physical training versus defensive tactics training? Or was there different types of injuries occurring in one versus the other? Or what did you see there? Yeah, I think in this study in particular, like the most that we were reported was from physical training. I don't remember what the actual split was um, on that. But yeah, most of what we were seeing was occurring during physical training. And I think you know, to your point, um, being a larger agency and having a larger recruit class, um, a lot of times, you know, fitness levels varied uh, quite a bit. And, you know, some people are, you know, better able to withstand the rigors of training over time than, you know, than others. Um, so that that's a really big factor is, you know, kind of, you know, when, when they're coming in, you know, especially in agencies that particularly do like a lot of running, which this one in particular did tend to focus a little bit more on aerobic conditioning, um, which kind of, if you, I mean, from a logical standpoint, if you think about it, you know, if you're doing a lot of aerobic conditioning, it's not really a shocker that the majority of injuries were lower extremity followed by lower back, you know? So that, it really does get down to what types of training are you, you know, implementing and, you know, what are those going to be most likely to maybe agitate or irritate? Uh, Similarly, you know, with, with groups that tend to do things that are more like, you know, high intensity interval training or circuit style training, um, you know, there may be some different types of injuries that are going to be more associated with um, that style of training. So that's, I think, in, in general, what we look at is, you know, what's creating or, or facilitating maybe specific injuries, and then how do we help, 
you know, plan around that a little bit more logically. Right. Okay. And so on that, I want to ask you a question about, sure. so when we look at task relevance of the criterion environment, so we have, if we, let's say I know I've, I've done an analysis of my agency and I know that the, the bulk of my officers are getting injured on the street in mm -hmm. physical force encounters that are, um, for that are person on person, they're dynamic, yep. they're ground fights. Often they're involving a lot of ballistic forces, uh, mm -hmm. ballistic. I don't mean shooting. I mean, motor ballistic right. type yeah, of right. forces. Ex yeah, ex um, yeah, excessive force. Yeah. Right. So, so my question is, if I know that almost all of my injuries to my officers are not occurring during foot pursuits, mm -hmm. they're occurring during fights where right. a fast twitch fiber that's going to be demanded for maximal ballistic power and torsion. If that's what's going to be needed, then shouldn't I reverse engineer my fitness training in order to create those conditions as best I can in my, like, I'm just trying to wonder, like, wh why would I take my officers on long cardio runs when there's like a 1% chance that they're going to need that degree of cardio. Plus I'm focusing on slow twitch muscle fiber development, yeah, like help, that, help, help us understand this. Uh, well, that's the million dollar question, maybe literally. So when you look at that, so this is not to downplay the importance of cardio respiratory fitness. It's very important from just a general health standpoint, sure. um, you know, just being a healthy human being and having a good base of aerobic fitness is actually going to support you during those higher intensity bouts. Cause basically the, the wider your aerobic base is, then the better you're going to recover in between those high intensity bouts. However, just like anything else, I think a lot of times it potentially gets overemphasized in the training program, especially when you start looking at the actual needs of a law enforcement officer. So, I mean, if you look at most of the like legitimate critical tasks that an officer has to endure, most of those are, gonna, like you said, it's going to be strength, power, speed based in general. So it's really, really important that we we have the body conditioned up to a level where it can tolerate that stress. So, I mean, and I think from, from my perspective, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to build, I don't want to say as much capacity as possible, but really I'm trying to give them a good level of capacity. So basically, you know, if we're in a, you know, a fight situation or, you know, in, in a high intensity situation, your threshold before you break is much greater because if you have a low capacity threshold, then you're going to be easier to break this if it has a higher capacity. Now, I think the, the hard thing for me in that situation is to also also realize like I can't prevent every single injury and that, that sometimes things just break. It is what it is. But I think some of that also gets back down to, you know, what level of risk am I willing to accept? And, you know, would I, if I had to choose between somebody getting injured in a, you know, combative situation where they are literally trying to save their life or a partner's life versus in training, I'm going to pick that every day. <laughs> But my goal is to make sure that when you get in that situation, that you have a, enough capacity that it takes a longer period of time before that happens to you and before you do break. Okay. But you're, you're dead on. And I will say this too. I think, you know, again, just from a, let's be a healthy human being standpoint, cardiorespiratory fitness is really important. Um, I think it, it's just like everything else that we talk about in life. It, it has to be the right balance for what we expect. And anytime we we place an inordinate amount of emphasis on one of those variables of fitness versus looking at a little bit more of a holistic approach to where it's a little bit more balanced. That's when we run into trouble. And and you know, and again, this is a little bit anecdotal, but in general, if you look like your your average like special operations or SWAT officer, it's not really the strongest guy that's the best. It's not the one who endures that's the best. It's that guy who's pretty good at everything all the time who tends to have the most success because they can handle more situations. So I, I don't want to say we want to be like, like aggressively average, but that's not a bad thing to be. If you can be, if you can be above average in everything, you're probably going to be okay. You don't have to be exceptional in anything, but just above average is probably a good space to live. Right. That's a good, that's a good recommendation. So I think the takeaway from that, that would be for trainers and fitness trainers is, is obviously, as you said, we're not downplaying the importance of lifestyle fitness, which is critically important for not just for 
for, for law enforcement performance, but for stress resilience and all kinds of 100%. reasons. But we also need to balance that with the, the short amount of time we have in the academy. How do we condition those muscular systems and those movement, the kinematics that are most likely going to be used by the officer in those violent encounters. And I think, like you said, when we can strike some kind of a sweet balance between those two approaches, we're, we're probably on our way. Yeah, I agree, Chris. And I think, you know, one of the big challenges that you kind of highlighted earlier is a lot of that is going to be predicated on who, who you accept into training Academy from a fitness standpoint. And and that gets into a whole nother conversation that <laughs> truthfully, you can't even talk about without you know, thinking about litigations and, and other things of that nature, but you know, it really gets down to, you know, survivability of training. And, and when I say that, like, you know, how, how fit do you need to be just to get through this process? Because I mean, you know, most of the groups I've worked with, it's, you know, a 22 to 27 week period of life where, you know, I don't want to say you're never going to have that much stress on you because that's not probably necessarily accurate, but there's a lot of stress going on at that time. And it's coming from a lot of different directions where, I mean, one, you're not guaranteed a job at that point. Um, you, so you're, you're basically trying to win and keep a job. Um, you know, your, your physical, the physical workload that you may be experiencing there during that time frame may be elevated compared to what you were doing prior to that. Recovery time may not be as good. You know, nutritional eating patterns may not be, you know, quite as on point as what we'd hope. So it's just, it's a, it's an interesting time to where we're trying to really balance out those stressors to make the individual as resilient as possible amidst kind of all the chaos of just the process. Exactly. Exactly. So one of the things you mentioned in your report is that previous injuries were the strongest predictor of future injuries. Absolutely. And so, yeah. Maybe you can unpack that a little bit because what what I couldn't figure out was what, were those previous injuries predictive of future injuries in the same site or in other words, the same type of future injuries yeah. or were previous injuries more indicative of overall lack of conditioning? And it was that that would be predictive of future. Uh, it's it's prob well, it's it's kind of well, well, maybe a little bit of both, like really the intent of that. So that's just looking at not necessarily law enforcement in particular, but that's just everybody in particular, right? So I think we all, you know, if, if you're like me, you know, like you got a few years on you, I still do active things. I've got a lot of things that have broke over the years. And when those injuries occur, there's usually going to be some kind of a downstream effect from that. So give you a, uh, a for instance on that, like when I was about 30 years old, I had a really, really severe ankle sprain on the left side. Since then, I have broken my right foot twice sprinting and had a grade two gastroc tear on the right side. So the left side injury never popped up again. But because of that, there's a slight amount of compensation that occurs to the right side. So I favor that side a little bit more. So the downstream effect from the left ankle injury is a right side that's had you know multiple injuries now. So it's not necessarily one of those things where that injury is going to happen in that specific site again, you know, per se, but, you know, the, the body's a pretty miraculous piece of equipment and the whole body's connected. And, uh, you know, the example I actually tell with my students a lot is there was a, a Hall of Fame pitcher, so Dizzy Dean. So Dizzy Dean actually blew out his shoulder because he fractured his big toe. And you, you, like you said, you try and unpack that. It's like, well, how on earth does that happen? Well, basically, in, in short, it altered his biomechanics. Mm. So he didn't want to land on that big toe. So he basically turned the foot out more, which put more stress on the shoulder and the shoulder is what went. So it, it's it's kind of, you know, if you want to put it like in law enforcement terms, um, like victims cry, suspects run. <laughs> so a lot of times, like the place where you see that injury exhibit itself may not have actually been the cause of that injury. Um, so like, if, for instance, if you look at the knee, so typically if you get a knee injury, it's not because it's a knee issue per se, it's because something either happened at the foot or at the hip that didn't allow you to stabilize that knee and keep it in position. So, you know, a lot of times if we're trying to do like a prehabilitation program, like we do a lot of work, like trying to focus on the glutes because it's an external rotator of the hip, which helps keep knee tracking better, um, versus, you know, it kind of going into that, uh, uh, well, to simplify it, so you don't go into that position where the knee kind of buckles in. So, right. so yeah, it, it, it is one of those things where, you know, it could be an injury to that specific joint and or 
muscle tissue again, or there could be a downstream effect to where it pops up somewhere else. Okay. So if I'm, if I know that my student has had a previous injury as they're coming into my Academy and I've, and, and we're aware of what previous injuries are, how would that inform a prehabilitation approach then? Like what would I do differently by knowing that? Yeah. So I think kind of like we said before is in part that may be, so a couple different things. So I think if across the board, you're seeing people that have similar issues, right? And, and this kind of comes from our profiling that we do before. So if we see a lot of individuals that have either lower back issues or they have limited rotation from in the thoracic spine, we're probably going to throw a little bit more of that into the training program, realizing that, okay, there's some deficits here that we need to kind of bolster up. So it's it's like basically doing a basic SWOT analysis. So, you know, your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. So if we identify some of those threats up front, then we know that those are some things that we might want to check on. So like, for instance, with this particular study that we did, so ankles, knees, you know, lower backs and shoulders, we know that, you know, in general terms, those are issues that we tend to see in training academy. So what we might end up doing is spend a little bit of extra time when we're doing a warm up or a cool down to focus on those areas to make sure that we're addressing them. Now, everybody is going to bring probably some individual baggage as well. So I think that's when you look at injuries, you have to look at as a group, what is common? And then on an individual basis, what are those things we have to work around? And, you know, and this is, and this is where, you know, you, from a training perspective, you got to be kind of savvy to that because, you know, some people will feign injuries to get out of things. Um, I mean, it, it definitely happens, but if we know there's already something there pre-existing and it's an individual that, you know, there's a certain element of trust there. Like usually I just say, Hey, look, I know your ankle's an issue. Just if something bugs you, communicate that to me and we can make some adjustments in your program. So most of the time with every single exercise that I have in a training program, especially when you're dealing with large groups at once, I'll usually have my target exercise. And then I might have, you know, here's a one level up, here's a one level down in case I need to make a modification. And, you know, a lot of times I'll, uh, I try not to, I mean, I try to be as diplomatic as I can most of the time. Um, but, you know, most of the time I'll go up to and say, hey, do me a favor for you. I think this is probably a better modification on this exercise to deal with that injury. This is what I want you to do for me. And, and most of the time it's not any easier than the other one. It's just different. Right. So, so I think that's the big thing is making sure that, you know, we're still trying to build that robustness that we're getting in all of our other cadets, but um, maybe we just have to take a little bit different strategy with that person to to make some minor adjustments. And, you know, the, the reality is you don't want to have to alter the entire training program, but it may be, you know, on these two or three exercises, I'm going to make this little adjustment with you that I think may help you specifically. Okay, that's good. That's helpful. So um, one of the things that stood out for me in reading your study is uh well i'll just cut to the chase here and, and th so this is my takeaway is that that it was the clear to me that the officers who had the poor fitness that fell in the lower those percentile uh categories were much more prone to being injured and then you looked at the timing of those injuries in the academy as well which is interesting but is that what you found? Because I was looking at the 20th percentile, 40th percentile, 60th percentile, and the frequency of injuries within those percentiles. So what did you see there? Yeah, I mean, it, it's not rocket surgery, is <laughs> it? I mean, it's and it's one of those things I joke a lot of times, like I do the research that we pretty much already know, but we need to document. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, it's probably not a shocker to go, hey, guess what? If you have to be a less fit individual, your chances of breaking are better. That's pretty well common sense. Um, and yeah, that is what we tend to see is people who are below, you know, certain thresholds tend to have a, a greater risk. Now, why does that happen? Again, it could be maybe the reason they're unfit is because, you know, maybe there was a previous injury that hinders their ability to do certain types of exercises. Uh, maybe, it, it, you know, one thing that we do tend to see also is sometimes there's kind of a bell curve um, where it's the super fit people or the unfit people that get hurt. And then everybody in between tends to be okay. Cause sometimes the super fit people can overdo certain things and end up injuring themselves. And the underfit people are being asked to do too much. And, you know, well, and I say being asked to do too much based off where their fitness level is, they're not prepared to do what is needs to be asked of them. So to clarify that, yeah. um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's one of those things where, you know, if you take the the more fit person in general terms, if we're all doing the same training program, that more fit person, if they're working at the same level, is going to not 
um, have the have the same recovery process, if you will. So usually they're going to recover a little bit better from it because again, they have a wider and, and deeper capacity than that other person. So they're really not straining themselves as hard. I give, give you another example of this from um, the ROTC program that I just mentioned before. So we actually did some research where we put uh, heart rate monitors on for people who were considered our top performers and our low performers. And so they all have to do a two mile run in a certain amount of time. Well, the good news is like everybody passed. So nobody failed the test. So that's a good thing. However, when we went back and looked at the heart rates, the people who were less fit had a significantly higher stress place on them during that same event than the more fit people. So, you know, the other aspect of that goes is, you know, in, in this particular case, the less fit people were actually a little bit heavier as well. So in addition to that, now you have like increased joint stress and trauma and things of that nature. So even though they could do it, the physical stress being placed on their body is going to be significantly greater than that person who basically has a, a more robust system who can handle those stressors better and accommodate them. So, so yeah, it's, um, it, it's, it's one of those things. It's really, you know, not, not again, not a difficult concept to get across, but I think the bigger challenge is, is how fits fit enough. And, you know, that's what a lot of my research over the last decade is kind of focused around is, you know, <laughs> It's interesting when you look at entering into training academy, it's not like, hey, we're going to go get our you know most fit people and go get them. It's like, okay, how how unfit can you actually be and still be able to do this job? And that's that's a lot harder number to figure out in the long run. Right. And exactly. And I think that was where I was going to go with my next question is, is I was like, why, why would we let, let's just take all the uh, the other politics and the and the sure. difficult the difficulties of yeah. filling recruit classes and all that if we can just put that in the parking lot for a second but if we say sure. okay i just look at at this study and i'm it occurred to me is why do we have recruits in the 20th percentile in the academy like, like right. why why are we there well if, and so here's the thing and i think you know fundamentally you're always going to have people in the 20th percentile but the difference is is as the fitness level elevates that 20th percentile is more fit <laughs> So I think that's the key is, you know, having some kind of a fitness standard where you go, okay, you know, this is the level of risk we're willing to accept. And, you know, and there was some stuff done in uh, the Australian defense system where they were looking at, um, you know, using, using the beep test as an assessment. So basically for, for those of you that aren't familiar with that, it's just a shuttle run. So it starts out relatively slow and then, you know, as the levels increase, the speed increases, and you have to run faster, basically. And so, you know, Australian Defense used that as a uh, kind of a screening system to determine, you know, people that they wanted to accept into training and, you know, those that they didn't. And really what they did is they they screened everybody. And then they said, okay, you know, looking at this number right here, um, you know, if we put our cutoff number at, you know, let's say a 7-2 on that shuttle run test versus a 6-8, how many injuries does that equate for? So, you know, under, you know, this number, it may be, let's say under, you know, seven, two, you, you have, uh, you know, you know, or if your cut is that you get 20% injury rate, right? Okay. If you take it down to six, eight, then, you know, that may, you know, you may lower the injury or the uh, injury rate, but you know, your, your cadet class isn't going to be probably as good as you want. So really what it gets down to is what, what level of risk are you willing to accept? You know, so and it is that balance because, you know, right now, you know, everybody, I mean, we're all kind of fighting that same situation where we have a, a lot smaller recruiting pool and everybody's going after that same pool. So, you know, the people that are, you know, looking at going to law enforcement, you know, the same people from the military looking at these people and firefighting and everything else. So a lot of it is like going back in, breaking these numbers down and going, OK, at this certain level, we tend to see, let's say, a 20 percent injury rate. If we increase our standard a little bit more, maybe we only see a 15% injury rate. It's like, is are you willing to accept 15% of people getting injured? Or do you want to make that even higher where you get less injuries, but now it reduces our re recruiting pool? So that's, you know, because, you know, sometimes within that percentage, like you're going to have some people that, you know, by the numbers don't look like they should make it through, but make it through. Um, so that that's really what a lot of it gets down to is like, you know, what level of risk will you accept and what level of injuries are you willing to tolerate to make sure that you have the best people in the job. Right. And that's exactly it. The best people in the job. And from a law enforcement executive's perspective, a lot of that risk also includes, 
you know, when we look at so many of the high profile events that have occurred recently uh, mm -hmm. in recent years is many of those have occurred because of an inability to physically control violence at early yeah. stages. And so when officers are incapable of doing that, they lack confidence and competence yep. to control physical resistance at lower levels. And it escalates to now higher levels of force or an officer involved shooting. I mean, that, that risk speaks to me to re directly to this issue as well as how, how fit is fit enough. Yeah, I agree. And, 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 you know, to clarify, I don't do this job, but, you know, my job is to look at what you guys do and try and help provide some guidance. So I don't ever want to give that connotation. And, you know, certainly I, I, I couldn't do the job. I'd be the worst. But the one thing I will say is in general terms, if physical fitness is not one of your tools that you can use, then you're going to go to another tool to compensate for that. And a lot of times those tools become, you know, progressively more lethal faster if, fitness is taken out of the equation. Absolutely. Absolutely. So let's talk about the cadence of those injuries through the academy. You you did see some spikes, which mm -hmm. I thought was interesting, but I couldn't distill whether, did you know like what was occurring in the training when those spikes were occurring during those weeks uh, that would have been more conducive to injuries? Yeah. And offhand, I don't recall. I'd have to go back and look at the specific like uh, weeks to, to give you an accurate answer. But, you know, generally what you're going to see is those weeks are going to be the ones that are punctuated by higher training loads, you know. And, you know, like like we said before, certainly during like defensive tactics weeks and things like that, we tend to see an elevation in injuries. Now, some of those are going to be like acute um, in nature. And, you know, some of those are going to be just like cumulative overload over time. Um, but usually, you know, what we'll see is like, you know, in weeks where maybe the um, – so let, let's say maybe the distance, like, and we talk about aerobic conditioning. So a lot of times when there's a, a big spike in that, um, maybe the running rate or the level of physical activity, we tend to see greater rates of injury. So I think, you know, in general, you know, in, in the strength conditioning world with athletics, normally what we kind of say is that you don't really want to increase the overall training load by more than about 10% per week um, in order just to, to make sure that it's done in a progressive and systematic manner. And, you know, so when you start going beyond that, you, you elevate risk of injury because there's a good chance that the body hasn't um, been, been uh, built enough in order to help, uh, you know, tolerate the increased level of stress that's being placed on it. So basically that cumulative overload that you get on the body becomes too great for the body to sustain it, which again, is kind of why it's beneficial to have more fit people to begin with is because typically if they're more fit, then it doesn't have as big of an impact on them. But for people who are like literally you know, walking in the door that are, you know, kind of, kind of lucky to be there from a physical standpoint, those big spikes, that's when we start seeing the big rates of injuries happen. It, it's interesting, like not in this agency, but another one I work with, what we tend to see is about week three, into training, we we could almost say by so this this particular agency had roughly about a twenty percent injury rate that resulted in exit of academy or, or separation, and it was really interesting when we broke down the numbers. We saw that most of those individuals were gone by week three, and you know at, at that point in time after that we the injury rate was pretty negligible. So. So really those first three weeks were a big, big factor in who was going to be successful and who wasn't. And part of that was, you know, there's some initial training that goes on during those weeks, but also it kind of separates out the people who maybe, you know, came in at a lower fitness level and just couldn't handle, handle the stress. Okay. And I, I was curious if you know, because I've heard that sleep deprivation, at least in athletics. And I think the Australian, you mentioned the Australian yeah. army. They, I read a study recently that they've conducted as well about injuries in basic training mm -hmm. and they correlated sleep deprivation with a much higher incidence of injuries in athletics. I know it's like the number one or number yep. two predictor of injuries is sleep deprivation. How, yep. how do you think that plays out in the academy? Like, has that, has anyone looked at the relationship between that the cadence of the academy, the spikes in the injuries, and the sleep is there sleep deprivation that you know? So we actually started to do that at one point in time where we even got like ready bands to monitor sleep, and uh, somewhere along the line of the academy, it just it got thwarted pretty quick uh, for other reasons. But that that is something that needs to be done because I mean I think when you look at it. 
I mean, one, as you said before, n- number one thing that you can do outside of doing physical training is get more sleep. It is what it is. Um, yeah, and that's what's funny when people come like, oh, you know, should I take this supplement or that supplement? Like, dude, just sleep more. That's like the absolute number one thing that you can do is try and get, you know, at least, you know, that, that, you know, eight hours of sleep a night. And again, I know that's not entirely practical for everybody, but, you know, to some extent, more is better to a point. Um, but yeah, during training academy, like it's, it's an interesting situation depending, you know, especially on the type of academy that you're in. So if it's, you know, you know, we're doing like a live in academy, um, that's, you know, I mean, you're basically going to communal living and you're having to deal with other people who, I mean, you know, maybe, you know, Bob over here snores at night and you can't get to sleep. And, you know, there, there's a whole lot of other extraneous factors, plus just the overall stress of being like out of sorts and not in your own environment. Um, and, you know, trying to, to adjust to all that in addition to, you know, waking up the next day and kind of having to do it all over again for, you know, an extended period of time. So, yeah, no, it, it's, um, to the best of my knowledge, I am not aware of any research that's been done on that yet, but it would be something that would be very, very worth looking at. Right. So if any, any agencies are out that the one to uh, us to jump in, we're happy to do it. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. And I hope that someone who will listen to this will definitely take you up on that because and likewise, yeah, you know, I think um, a lot of the re- recruits we're getting in the academy now, they're often older, they <laughs> Uh, have spouses, they have families, and then the academy pressure, they go home and they've got three, four hours of homework at night. And so they're getting five, maybe hours of sleep a night. And then you wonder what even, even is the quality of that sleep and and how is that conducive to a learning in the first place or, or yeah. optimizing motor learning and academic learning and but then contributing to injury. So I think yeah. this is yeah. one of those elephants in the room that we need to get a handle on. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the, the bottom line is like not getting an adequate amount of sleep literally kills everything. I mean, it, it has a negative impact on everything. And, and full disclosure on this, I mean, back when I was younger, I was that guy who, you know, I'm up at two in the morning cranking stuff out. Because I mean, I think, you know, when we were growing up, we always had those t-shirts that said, hey, basically, when, when you're not working, somebody else is going out there and they're going to kick your ass whenever they get into competition. <laughs> like that's, it's kind of that mentality. And, you know, again, more is better only to a point, but, you know, after that, you know, you actually may be doing yourself more of a disservice. And I think as I've gotten older, the more I've realized like, man, it, it it's funny how things kind of come full circle. Cause before like growing up, like I was a performance guy, it's like, Hey, you, you know, run fast, jump high, you know, push your, your body's limits, but then all those wellness aspects, like, okay, you know, you know, eat properly and, you know, or, or make sure you're fueling your body properly before events, hydrate, get sleep, um, you know, do all those little things that make a big difference. Like the older I get, the more I realize that, man, I absolutely cannot get away with not doing that now. Um, and, I, and I've kind of joked like, man, sometimes half of my workout is just getting warmed up so I can go back to what I was doing. And, and that's why I'll tell my students like, man, I can do everything I did when I was 20. It just hurts more, takes longer to recover from it. <laughs> so, and like I said, there's a little bit more of a cost with it now, but but yeah, as you said, I think, you know, it, it is one of those things where I used to kind of, you know, almost pride myself on the fact that I could do more with less sleep. And that's not, that's not really a badge of honor anymore. Like it used to be. I mean, it's one of those things where, you know, a lot of times people say like, Hey, I can function on this. And I think the reality is that you may be able to function at a higher level than most people can with less sleep, but the reality is like, you're still not at your best. Right. And getting by and, and being able to function is not the benchmark or standard that we should be aiming for in when You're optimal absolutely. human performance is required. Yeah. And I mean, and I think that's the thing that, you know, I'm really excited about, you know, when I, you know, kind of jumped back in this, like, you know, 12, 13 years ago, you know, that whole tactical athlete concept, you know, before, you know, and I've had so many people want to debate me about that. It's like, oh, you know, we're not really athletic at all. I'm like, well, that may be the case, but the bottom line is that you have to do physically demanding things and, you know, all those things that athletes do to take care of their body, to prepare themselves for competition really is how law enforcement officer needs to think. And really, because if you think about with an athlete, their training is prioritized. It's not even up for debate. Like it is something that Mm -hmm. it is, you know, I mean, in an athletic sense, their whole life revolves around the training schedule and making sure they're prepared. So, you know, in a lot of ways, what we were trying to basically promote with that is that, look, like your training and you taking care of yourself is a huge, huge element of your job. 
and we you should dedicate the time, energy, and effort to it as if you were training for a you know an Olympics, if you will. Um, and then you know, from my perspective, it's like, dude, like do that, and then max out your pension. Like, let's get you to retire and actually enjoy life after this thing is over. Yeah, and that's you know my message to my officers when I was in the academy is it's amazing that athletes will put in so much time and energy and passion and money and resources in order to win a medal. And law enforcement officers struggle to even put in a fraction of that in order to win a fight. So you can come home to your family. And like you said, retire successfully after a career and bounce your grandbabies off your knee. (laughs) I mean, what more reward do you need to motivate you for this type of care yeah well i think you know to your point i think sometimes and again this isn't to nitpick or anything like that but work with a lot of people i think sometimes there may be a little bit of a complacency that happens where it's like hey you know i haven't had to do this in my career so you know what are the odds it's going to happen to me it's like well i don't know like hopefully it never does but if it does i want to make sure that you get out of it safely you know and i think that you know for for instance we had one situation we're doing some testing where we're doing a uh, victim drag and, you know, we we're talking to, you know, one of the administration and, and he said, like, I've done this for 25 years. I've never had to do a victim extraction once. I'm like, well, right. But is it reasonable that you may have to? It goes, well, maybe, but it's just highly unlikely. I'm like, but it's likely. And he's like, well, I'm like, all right. So let me ask a question. You got your gun on you, right? He's like, yeah. I'm like, have you ever had to shoot it at, at a human being? Well, no. Like, okay, well, is it possible you may have to? Yeah. I'm like, so is that why you carry it? He's like, oh, I get it. <laughs> so so that's the whole thing. Is like it, It's a tool you have. You may never need it. Hopefully you don't. But if you do, it's there for you. And and I think that's, um, you know, really how we equate the, the whole fitness equation is like, you know, it's another tool in your arsenal, basically. Right. Absolutely. So we're quickly coming to the end of our interview time, Dr. Dawes, but a couple of things I want to ask you here. You state in your study, you said, given the proportion of injuries occurring during physical training, future research into injury mitigation programs should examine the impacts of periodized physical training programs, ability-based training, and upskilling of physical training instructors. So in the time we have left, can you just break that down for us? I think there's three critical implications here that you just mentioned. And so why don't you walk through those for us? Yeah, absolutely. So basically what periodized training means is it's just, it's kind of phasic training, if you will. So basically we're trying to develop a program that is going to have logical sequential uh, buildups in intensity and, you know, reductions in volume over time. So one thing to think about is whenever we're doing this in the sport world, like typically there's a at the beginning of the year, there's a higher volume of training. So like the number of sets, reps, and things like that you do, but the intensity is going to be lower because what we're trying to do is we're just trying to get you conditioned to the point where you can withstand the intensities we're going to put on you later. So it's trying to build a bigger engine, if you will. So like during that time, you know, we may focus on a little bit more muscular endurance, a little bit of muscular size and, and things of that nature, and a little bit more like conditioning, like, you know, cardiorespiratory. Um with athletics in particular, like a lot of times we'll try and transition that into things that are going to be a little bit higher intensity and reduce the overall sets and reps and things like that that they have to do. That also kind of logically makes sense when you look at a lot of training academies, because um, if you look at you know the skill development portion of it, a lot of times those come a little bit later in the academy. So in, in academy training, like periodized training tends to work really, really well because you have... I mean, for the most part, it's prescribed. Like I know exactly where they're going to be, what they're going to be doing. And I can moderate those stressors out on their body and build them up over time to make sure when they get to, um, you know, their last physical ability test, or maybe it's defensive tactics training or whatever your priority physical event is that they're as prepared as they can be. Now, the flip side of that is when you become an officer, when is it important for you to be able to peak? Hell, it could be any time. It could be any moment. So that's the whole thing is like, if you, as an officer, if you may have to do anything in your job, then, you know, we basically have to train you with everything that we can to make sure you're prepared for that. So in those models with those individuals, the periodization plan we use is going to be more uh, diverse where maybe 
over the course of a week, we're going to touch on a little bit of strength power one day, a little bit of muscle size another day, and a little bit of endurance the next, and then kind of cycle that through to to make sure that you're pretty good at everything all the time. Like I don't need to I don't need you to necessarily be exceptional at any one thing, but I need you to be pretty okay um, on most aspects. Now, part of that I will say is there is also the personal standpoint of it. Like if you have a personal goal of like you want to run a marathon or you want to compete in a powerlifting competition that's fine as long as we're balancing that out with the needs of your job as well to make sure that you can stay occupationally fit. So that's that's really what periodization is. It's kind of looking at you know, logical sequential phases to help build up and enhance performance and also looking at load variation over time. So if we're going to have a high intensity period, we're probably going to bring that down with a low intensity period or moderate and kind of cycle it through. Because if you just go hard all the time, usually something's going to break. Um, and that's, and, and honestly, that's a really hard concept to get across to people. And, and bluntly, I'm a pretty hard charger and I have a hard time backing myself off on certain things because I just like to go. But from a, from a logical standpoint, I have to take a step back and like, okay, if you were telling somebody else how to do this, you have the training, you know what to do. You need to back yourself off so you can actually rebound. And the cool thing about it is we, there's a, a couple of individuals I've worked with that are super hard chargers. And we'll usually do like either maybe a three up, one down or four up, two down paradigm where maybe we have three weeks of increasing intensity. And then we kind of give them a week. Um, I don't say a break, but let's say you're doing for just easy math. Let's say you're doing four sets of eight for these three weeks and the intensity is progressively getting higher and higher. Well, on that fourth week, instead of in four sets of eight, I may take you down to two sets of eight. So the intensity stays high, but I drop the overall amount of training down. And what typically will happen is when you come back the next week, you're even better. So because we've we've maintained the intensity to maintain the progress, but we strip some of that fatigue away. So when you rebound back, you're able to actually push limits even greater. And I've had several people where I you know, have really fought me. I'm like, dude, just trust me. Do this for a week and let's see what happens. And after they've done it, like, oh, my God, this is amazing. And so it's it's one of those things that, you know, it's trusting the science. But I mean, even in my position where I got a dang PhD in this, it's still hard psychologically to make yourself do it because you still think you need to be pushing. But trust me, it pays dividends. It really, really does. Um, but it takes discipline to be able to take that down week, too. Um, that's kind of the concept of the periodization plan. Now, hey, I, I, can I just ask a question on that? Yeah, well, please. So with the periodization, then in let's say in the academy, would it be important for Th that fitness periodization to also be coordinated with say the defensive tactics 100%. regimen, because that will also put loads at certain times throughout yes, the sir. Academy. Yeah. Chris, and you're yeah, very astute. That's what you're, I mean, really at, as trainers, like from a physical standpoint, we are in the stress management bi business is what it gets down to. So basically if I apply the right amount of stress on you, your body's going to adapt and it's going to get better. If I put too much stress on you, it's going to break. So that's what I'm trying to, I'm trying, it's like, the, we call it the Goldilocks principle. So it, it's not, not too much, not too little. It's the just right amount. We're trying to figure out what is the just right amount of stress to keep you getting better to make sure that you don't break. So that's, that's kind of what periodization is. And if you guys want, um, again, I'm happy to provide, you know, anything that you need or want based off that topic or, you know, heck, even personal conversations about strategies and the, the good news is there's a lot of ways to do it and there's not necessarily one right way. Um, but the biggest thing is just that cyclical variation of the loading. That's going to be the big key is like, so again, mixing up the high intensity periods with lower intensity for recovery. Um, so that's what periodization is. Now the ability based training one, basically what that is, is, you know, kind of trying to stay away from like a one size fits all training approach if possible. Um, so if you think about it this way, I mean, especially like basic training in, in the military, that's probably the, in, in especially paramilitary programs, everybody comes in, everybody does the same workout and, you know, the fit people, you know, they tend to tolerate it reasonably well. The moderate people will get challenged a little bit and the unfit people may be getting pushed too hard. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to tailor the program to the level of the person that we're dealing with to a certain point, which is, you got to be very savvy with it and it can be very challenging. Um, but one of the things that we we have seen in the past is if you don't use an ability-based approach, um, when we run the statistical numbers on it, in general, you'll see an overall trend where the whole group gets better. But a lot of times what happens is the people who are really fit may get less fit because they're doing a program that's really built for that person who's the in-between person. 
the unfit people tend to get overtrained because again, we're shooting to that middle and the only people that really get what they need are in the middle. So what ends up happening is you have a, a larger middle group that tends to get a little bit better. You have a fit group that may get actually a little bit worse. And, you know, the people that are unfit who get better and don't break get better. So it skews it that direction, but it's really not meeting the needs of everybody in the program. So that's one of the things that's like super challenging is trying to develop a program where everybody can kind of push themselves at their own level and everybody gets better. Now, one of the things that we've done to give you an example of that is so with that beep test that I mentioned before. So that's not only a physical testing um, procedures that we use, but we also use that to develop training protocols. So what we'll do is we actually will look at that and we'll say, okay, with this beep test, we've got three groups, right? So here's our high performers, moderate performers, low performers. And then what we'll do is we may have like a sprint training day where everybody will start out on the line. And once we get those numbers, we can calculate how long it's going to take somebody to get from point A to point B, because at that point it just kind of becomes math, right? So let's say our high performer group, let, let's say we're going to go for a 10 second jog for with everybody, right? The high performers may go 60 yards, right? Because they're you know more fit. The, the moderate performers may go 55 because they're a little bit less fit. And then the low performers may go 50. Okay. So we're all running for 10 seconds. You know, we're all conditioning the same energy systems, but based off the ability level, we're kind of giving them the, the distance they need to make sure that we're not breaking them. And of course, then the goal is to get them to move up to that next tier whenever we can. And so they kind of graduate from one group to the next. So that's, that's one example of how to kind of progressively build that up, but it, does, it, it takes coordination and it takes a lot of thought to do that. Jay, are there resources that you would recommend if trainers are like, I want to look into this ability-based training yeah. model more, what would you, where would you point them to? So we actually, so we've done a paper um, that it's specifically called ability-based training um, that was focused on law enforcement or tactical populations. So one, I mean, I can provide that resource, no problem. Or, I mean, if you Google um, ability-based training and put like my name in and, uh, you know, Dr. Rob or Bob Lockie, we all, we all run and, and read and feed off each other pretty good. Um, the, if you put those names in, you'll find some more stuff about kind of how to take that approach. Perfect. Excellent. Thank you. And the last one is upskilling of trainers. Hit us yeah. with that one. Yeah. So that, man, and that's a, that's not meant to be like condescending in any way, shape or form, because I think the challenge that, that, that I've seen coming from an exercise science background is a lot of times what happens is the people that get put in charge of physical training or conditioning happen to be just the most fit people in the agencies. Right. And so basically like, hey, you're a fit guy or gal, you're in charge of fitness. Well, they've done what's worked for them. And typically that's what the training programs start to reflect. You know, so if you got somebody who's a really good lifter, well, guess what? Our academy lifts a lot. If they're good at running, guess what? They do a lot of running. Because, you know, part of that is like, you know what's worked for you, uh, but you you don't necessarily have the background and training to know how to build these different systems up at the same time. And, you know, in, in all honesty, there is also that element is like, okay, as the trainer, you don't really want to expose yourself and look bad. So you're going to tend to gravitate to what you're good at. Um, and that that's kind of just human nature. But now, with that being said, I got a really, really, you know, you know, lengthy background in the strength conditioning world. If you put me into law enforcement, and you asked me to do all the technical tactical skills and techniques required there, I would be the worst. So I think that's the part of it here is that it's looking at it doesn't make them worse people. It's just like, okay, that's not where your primary area of training is. So part of what we're trying to do is start to provide resources to help them get some of those um, trainings necessary in order to have a better understanding of how these systems work. And, you know, and some of the things that we use in elite performance to kind of use in these populations. And, uh, you know, right now I'm doing a lot of work with a group called Warriors Rest Foundation and a lot of others where we're actually trying to create some you know, certificate based programs and things like that to kind of upskill um, folks and, you know, a, a little bit more instead of like a, you know, kind of a weekend workshop type thing, more of like a mentorship type program to kind of help assist in that process. Is there anything that exists right now that would be available for trainers if they say, yeah, I really want to get away from personal preference driving uh, our training, our fitness training, and I want to really have a science based 
fitness approach, where where would they go to upskill themselves? Yeah, I'll tell you one group that's really good, and this and, and I am I am a little bit biased on this, so I'll fully own that is National Strength Conditioning Association. Um, you know, we uh, we've created a course called the Tactical Strength and Conditioning Practitioners Course. And it's it's a little bit more on the performance orientation side versus um, like more health and wellness, but it's really good if you're wanting to learn some of those more advanced techniques like you know strength training, um, car, you know um, you know aerobic conditioning, uh, you know speed, power training, things of that nature. Um, that's a it's like I said it's a great course. It's about a four day. Uh, but what we've done is like, you know, usually you'll we'll have a couple of instructors that will come out, teach the course and, uh, you know, try and help people get kind of upskilled in that area. And it and it's really cool because it's not a what to think. It, it's more of a how to think kind of class, you know. So based off your situation, your constraints, your challenges, you know, what's the best options? Um, but that's, you know, if anybody's interested in that and wants to reach out, I'm happy to get them connected on that. Heck, uh, I'm actually one of the certified instructors for that. So, I mean, if we could come out and teach at your place, that'd be even better. That's fantastic. So just once more for the listeners, that was the National Strength and Conditioning Association. Yes, sir. And the name of the program, one, one more time. It's, the, it's called the TSAC Practitioners Course or Tactical Strength and Conditioning Practitioners Course. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Well, Dr. Dawes, I can't believe it, but we're at the end of our hour here and it's been just an incredible uh, experience. Thank you for making the time to uh, come on the podcast. And I would encourage our listeners to, to please download that research paper, read it thoroughly, digest the information, the implications that are in there. And uh, take these recommendations that Dr. Dawes has been mentioning during this interview to heart. And uh, Dr. Dawes, how would you uh, want to have people reach out to you if they had more questions and wanted to follow up? How can they get in contact with you? Yeah, probably the the easiest way is just through email. Um, so it's going to be jay dot d a w e s at okstate.edu. So j dot dawes at okstate.edu. Worst case scenario, if you Google it, it pops up. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. All right. Well, Dr. Dawes, thanks again for making the time. And we would love to have you back on the bullpen if you'd have us. A hundred percent, man. It was a blast. Honestly, I could talk about this the rest of the day. So I appreciate you guys so much. All right. Thank you, sir.